Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dr. Lisa Cooper, the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Equity in Health and Healthcare here at Johns Hopkins. I'm also the director of the Johns Hopkins Urban Health Institute. On behalf of the Urban Health Institute and the Office of the Provost, I would like to welcome you to our 10th annual Social Determinants of Health Symposium. Over the years, the Social Determinants of Health Symposium has examined many of the root causes of health inequalities in Baltimore, from housing and food insecurity to inadequate educational and employment opportunities. We've also discussed strategies informed by science that have been effective locally and nationally. There has never been a more opportune time to focus on solutions to inequities. Inequities in health are driven in large part by structural factors, broader political, economic, social, and environmental conditions. So it's critical that we both identify and support policies that can bring about true and lasting changes and opportunities for all. These policies can mean the difference between life and death in communities that have been marginalized throughout our nation's history. We all know that change requires more than conversations. It requires action. So this year, our topic is don't talk about it, be about it. How civic participation and political engagement can impact health within your community. I'm thrilled to see the virtual room packed with researchers, political and religious leaders, community uh, uh, organizational leaders, faculty, students from Johns Hopkins and from all over Baltimore. As you can see, we are using an interactive platform this year and you can see all of the people I just mentioned if you click on the people tab on the right side of your screen. So many of our past symposia attendees and friends of UHI have commended us on the networking opportunities that this annual symposium has provided in the past. And even though we're still virtual this year, we hope the features of this platform will help you connect with like-minded people, engage with hardworking grassroots organizations, and perhaps reconnect with some old friends. We look forward to learning, growing, and connecting with you during this year's event. Let's start with a moment of mindfulness and grounding so we can set our intentions for the day. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Netta Gould, a clinical psychologist and assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Dr. Gould serves as director of the Johns Hopkins Mindfulness Program. In addition to treating adult patients with anxiety and depression using cognitive behavioral therapy, one of her primary areas of interest is teaching mindfulness to patients with psychiatric and other medical conditions. She also teaches mindfulness-based stress reduction to, to uh, faculty and staff to reduce stress and burnout. Dr. Gould was recently inducted into the Johns Hopkins Medicine Miller Coulson Academy of Clinical Excellence. She's a contributor to local and national media and news releases and she lectures regularly to audiences on the benefits of mindfulness meditation for health and well being. I know firsthand what an excellent instructor she is because I've taken many of her classes myself. Dr. Gould, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper, and good afternoon, everyone. Let's just take a few minutes to arrive into the present moment to settle in before the remaining, uh, before you initiate engagement in some of the other discussions today. So just settling in, taking a few deep breaths together. So we can draw a deep breath in and a long, slow exhalation. When you're ready, drawing the next breath in. And slowly releasing. One more time, taking a deep breath in. And this time as you exhale, just letting go of where you were a few moments ago 
letting go of where you may need to be later today and just bringing your attention to this moment. Sensing your body, sitting in the physical space where you're located. Sensing your feet connecting to the floor. Noticing sensations in the hands. And checking in with how you're feeling emotionally in this moment. Just in a word or two, labeling silently to yourself what's present in your emotional sphere. Recognizing that there'll be some challenging topics that are discussed this afternoon and being mindful of your emotions in this moment, but also throughout the day. Seeing if you can make space for these emotions without judging them. And finally, taking a moment to just set an intention for the day. Perhaps an intention to let go of judgments of yourself and others. Perhaps an intention to be open to new ideas and possibilities. And when you feel ready, gently returning your attention back to the breath. And for the next few breath cycles, just being present with the sensations of the in-breath and of the out-breath. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the remaining presentations today. Thank you so much, Dr. Gould. That was wonderful for grounding us and, and preparing us for this wonderful afternoon. Now we'll hear from experts in community building, politics, civic engagement, and health equity who have leveraged partnerships across various groups, organizations, communities, and sectors. We have an amazing lineup of speakers who will guide us as we explore these topics. Together, we'll learn how we can improve our city's health and do more for Baltimore by getting involved in our communities. Before we start the formal part of the program, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge indigenous and racial inequities. We acknowledge that Johns Hopkins University and our schools are on the traditional and contemporary lands of indigenous peoples. Our campus is on unceded lands of the Piscataway and Susquehanna people. Today, there are more than 7,000 indigenous peoples in Baltimore City, including members of the Piscataway, Lumbee, and Eastern Band Cherokee. We acknowledge the history of oppression and systemic inequities while representing all tribal nations' sovereignty. We strive to do our own work to address the inequities and disparities Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Native American persons, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, and other persons of color, members of religious minorities, LGBTQIA persons, persons with disabilities, and persons otherwise adversely affected by persistent poverty or inequality experience while expanding partnerships with and following the lead of these communities. The mission of the Johns Hopkins Urban Health Institute is to advance health and health equity in Baltimore by facilitating collaborations between communities, universities, and healthcare delivery systems to build collective capacity for achieving health equity in Baltimore. By mobilizing resources in support of promising strategies to achieve substantial gains in the health and well being of Baltimore residents, and by advancing and understanding dialogue 
by including community voices to build trust and enhance pathways to health, well being, and social justice in Baltimore. This mission is only made possible thanks to a truly dedicated team whose photos are displayed here. Many of our associate directors will support networking sessions throughout this afternoon. I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Rachel Thornton and Dr. Kendrick Wynn for their leadership in co-developing our symposium in partnership with our community leaders. Also, I would like to extend a special thanks to Nancy Molello, Natalie Wiggins, and Emily Carletto for their dedication and hard work to ensure the success of this symposium. Dr. Gwynn will now walk us through the agenda and go over some general announcements and housekeeping items. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. We have an exciting agenda for you today and you can see it on the screen. You can also find the agenda menu in the navigation bar at the top of your screen. There you will find all symposium sessions as well as the networking rooms that will be happening later today. Lauren Green from Dancing with Markers will, will live digital scribe our symposium today. Digital scribing is a visual note taking done with an iPad to produce a high level summary to help solidify the key takeaways. At the end of the day, we will ask Lauren to do a time lapse replay so that you can see the graphic unfold. Now we will go through some housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded and will be available after the symposium is over for viewing on this platform. Live closed captions are being auto-generated. The Q&A section uh, is where you can enter questions for the presenters in the Q&A window. Questions will be answered live or with short typed responses. Click the thumbs up button to bring popular questions to the top of the Q&A window. The chat is available for your reflections and open dialogue. For any technical support with the platform, please click on the need help, get, to get support on the top of the browser. We have a team of professionals standing by to assist, assist all quickly. We encourage you all to tag us as you tweet and post on social media throughout the event. Use the hashtag SDOH 2022 so that the conversations can continue online. You would also be able to see and share these posts via the social media wall. Back to you, Dr. Cooper. Thank you, Dr. Quinn. One of our objectives for hosting this annual symposium is to bring together experts, researchers, and practitioners from all relevant sectors to share science-informed strategies that promote health equity at the community level. We also aim to highlight innovative partnerships for research and service delivery that address the social determinants of health. So we hope this symposium will lead to stronger partnerships across Baltimore so that we can continue to build and restore the health of our communities. We also hope it will encourage you to get involved in your own local community. Johns Hopkins University and its associated medical institutions have made a commitment to being a force for good in the city of Baltimore. And the university's leadership has provided strong and consistent support for the Urban Health Institute, also known as UHI. It's my pleasure to introduce the provost of Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Sunil Kumar, to share a few words. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you all for joining. It's my pleasure uh, to be here uh, today uh, to welcome you all to the 2022 UHI Symposium. Um, to state the obvious, uh, Johns Hopkins University plays a major role in the Baltimore community as a university, as a healthcare provider, as an employer, and as a citizen. We are fortunate to not just reside within this great city, but also to serve as a partner institution, working to support its health, education, and growth. It, the university has many ways in which it tries to affect change in the city. Of course, one of the most effective ways to create positive change in a city is through civic participation. And by having your voice heard through strong advocacy and at the ballot box, our democracy is fundamentally dependent on an engaged and informed citizenry. Hopkins is compelled to understand our place in this democratic process and to use our tools to support our city's residents and the JHU community as they and we 
advocate and work for change in our communities. It is not enough to connect this back to the topic of today's symposium to just talk about it. We have to be about it. I want to give you two examples of leaders in the university, like Lisa Cooper and the UHI team, are doing to get the university closer to the community in this way. One is the Urban Health Initiative's Bunting Neighborhood Leadership Program. You will hear from the uh, alumni of this program, which is producing the next generation of Baltimore's community leaders who have the skills and knowledge to be transformative. Another uh, is an example from the School of Education. I spoke at their event earlier uh, last week, and this was the event was called Nobody Asked Me. Um, and this was a way to use participation from parents and students in the schools of Baltimore to change the Baltimore K through 12 education. And this is a program being run out of the School of Education at, at Hopkins. So I would not say that the university's average faculty member has already learned how to be an engaged participant in listening and a civically engaged participant in the city yet, but we are on our way there. And this symposium will help us get there sooner. And so I look forward to exploring more about what it means to do more for Baltimore today and in the coming years. So I wish you a productive and uh, informative symposium and turn it back to Dr. Cooper. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kumar, uh, for those welcoming words. Our next speaker has an up close and personal understanding of why civic engagement is important for community health. I'm excited to welcome Maryland State Senator Corey B. McRae, who serves District 45 in Baltimore City. Senator McRae, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Cooper. Just want to say kudos and just uh, stand an ovation in reference to the work that you, your uh, Urban Health Institute team, um, has moved forward with and just highlighting to make sure that we can collectively have this space um, at this moment. To the listener audience, for those of my friends that are in there, Dr. Cooper, let me say it's a lot of people that text me today and say, hey, I didn't know you were doing there. I saw I was at a groundbreaking and Jamie Wooten even said it to me. So just thank you for the, the how far you all reach, the impact that you have uh, within our neighborhood. My friends that I haven't seen in a pandemic, it's been too long. For those that I do not know, as Dr. Cooper has stated, my name is Corey McRae. I represent the east, northeast side of Baltimore City in the Maryland State Senate. Today, while I'm here, I just like to go over my who I am. I like to go over why I serve. I'd like to go over what we've done and then how we all can move together, if that's okay. Who is Corey McRae? Born and raised in the city of Baltimore, graduated from a school called Fairmont Harper, right there at Harper and 25th. I'll uh, save you the details about my childhood, but I would say that I face the same challenges that our young people face, young men, young women across the city of Baltimore and all looking for just one simple thing, which we call opportunity. I live in Overly now. I live there with my wife, Demetria, um, who's a teacher. I have four children. I got a Kennedy, Reagan, CJ, and Bryson. I'm an electrician by trade. I tell you all that opportunity came to me when I found the apprenticeship program that I went through, the five-year apprenticeship program, which took me out of the four blocks that I had known and expanded my uh, reach uh, to something further and being able to have a, a dramatic amount of folks that are impacting my life, I should say. I'm also an entrepreneur. I've been buying houses up and down Belly Road since I was 20 years of age. I uh, had a very fondness of trying my best to change the trajectory of my family and figured out how to do that in the right space. Um, I, I currently serve in the, house, in the Maryland State Senate, but I got my training wheels in the Maryland House of Delegates. So some people would say, Corey, uh, why do you serve? Why do you do what you do? And I would say that I know that I'm blessed. I know that I'm blessed to make it through the circumstances that I made it through during my childhood. I know that by the grace of God, that I had a mother that never gave up on her son. And one of the things that I always try to say is, is that while I was chasing money, I was chasing fiscal dreams, 
um, that the true measure of success is not um, how much money you have, but it's how many people can you get across that finish line um, there with you. I realize that uh, some of the equitable challenges that we have within our neighborhoods, for those that may not know, I'm talking about places like Darley Park, Berea, South Clifton Park, New Broadway East, where we've seen um, our government, where everyone pays taxes, but we haven't seen those tax dollars reciprocated in a number of the neighborhoods that I just mentioned, and they're all across the city. They're not just in the city of Baltimore. You'll find that uh, equity challenge, whether you're in Anne Arundel County, you'll see it up in Montgomery County, you'll see it in Baltimore County, and we have to fix that piece of it. Uh, Rashad. Folks are absolutely apathetic about government in general. I tell people to start voting until I was in my late 20s because my attitude towards politics was they leave me alone, I leave them alone. But one of the things that I realized is that politics is intertwined in our everyday lives, whether we like it or not. And if you're sitting on the sideline, you have other people that's making decisions for you. People are apathetic, Dr. Cooper, because they can't see where they're getting their money's worth. They can't see where they're being immediately served and their needs are being immediately served when they walk out the house. How do we get rid of that apathy? We make sure that, that when they call, we immediately respond. We make sure that when they email, we respond back to them in less than 24 hours. And we make sure that their basic fundamental needs of road paving, sometimes it's SNAP benefits, their educational opportunities, looking for that scholarship or that gap funding that they may not have, serving at the best possible means that we can, because that's what's going to get people to participate back in this process. There's also a level of communication. Dr. Cooper, you cannot be doing the work and no one knows that you're doing the work. You have to bring people along with you. Then I think about the educational part. So once you're serving, once you're responding, once you're moving in that direction and you're communicating, you have the responsibility as a leader to also educate them. What do I mean by that education? I think about the first African-American state senator in the 45th legislative district or East Baltimore as a whole, Dr. Cooper. And many people may not know that it was Robert Dalton who 51 years crossed that, that barrier or broke that barrier to be able to serve in the chamber that I serve in um, today. After Robert Dalton, there was a Robert Douglas. After Robert Douglas, there was a Nathaniel Irby. After Nathaniel Irby, there was a Sen Senator Nathaniel McFadden. Now that McFadden's not there, it's currently myself serving in that position. I would also lean in and say four out of the five are still living um, at this time uh, from that standpoint. So that education in reference to the fundamental history of East Northeast Baltimore is so important and we cannot lose that. We have to continue to repeat that because that's what removes that type of uh, apathy. The education component, the communication component, and just the level of service. So now that you've been in the Maryland House of Delegates, Corey, now that you've been in the Maryland State Senate, Corey, how, what have you done? I did the things that were important to me. I did the things that were fundamentally important to my neighborhood where they would be able to move. Many people may not know, Dr. Cooper, that the first time a person that's on parole or probation, I know Sam knows, but the first time that a person was on parole or probation that they got the right to vote was in 2016, the 2016 election in the state of Maryland. And that happened because we removed the arbitrary barriers that were placed in front of people that were home like you and me still had children that's educated in our public school system, still catch the same transportation system to get to work, the school, food insecurity, whatever it is, still want to make a decent wage. They care about it, but they did not have the fundamental right that me and you enjoyed, but that right was restored in 2016. That's one thing that we did with House Bill 980 back in 2015. I think about the minimum wage. Dr. Cooper, I can remember growing up, I can remember growing up when my mom worked two or three jobs and no one should ever have to work two or three jobs. That's not the, that's not the, the way of life, but that is a norm for a number of folks. So we worked on the minimum wage. How do you raise the minimum wage over a period of time to be able to make sure that people do not have to do these types of things, especially as we see things like uh, inflation and having this conversation on the Maryland Senate floor. So we watched it go from 1010 to $11 to $1175, and now it'll go up to $1250 and then move until it hits the uh, $15 an hour. Sam, was it fast enough? No, but at the end of the day, it's about how far you can get up that football field and make sure that we impact real people's lives. I think about transportation. I think about the, the buses that break down. I want to acknowledge that I have a high schooler. So I got a freshman and a high schooler. And I call um, uh, uh, Administrator Arnold because when that bus does not arrive, 
allow young people to go to school, for people to go to work, when it breaks down periodically, that is impeding people that don't have other options. They don't have the two or three cars. They only have public transit. We have to amplify and lift the voices of those folks that don't always have their voices heard. We were able to inject last year, Dr. Cooper, over $2 billion in a six year period to make sure that we're investing in our bus system, our light rail, our subway, and our mark train. This is important because some people do not have options while other people do enjoy options. Everyone don't enjoy the options. Everybody heard of the easy pass debacle that was going on and how it was impacting people's lives. Being able to do things like that. One of the things that wasn't the biggest, but this really, really impacted my communities, Black community specific, uh, Dr. Cooper. And I can remember as a young person driving was MAFE. So for those folks that are young, those folks that may not have a parent that they can get on insurance, their only alternative is MAFE. And then when I talk about these arterial uh, barriers, if you didn't have a certain percentage, 25% as a down payment, you then have to go to one of what we call a premium insurance company who then marks it up and able to tack on like a 30% charge. So your monthly payment isn't going for you to have insurance, it's going to the premium insurance company because they've then financed with a state, a quasi-government agency, and the quasi-government, the agency, the state, was the one that actually placed that barrier. That, we tried to get rid of that over the past several decades. If you know how many historical legislators had called and said, Corey, we could not move the needle because they were so impactful or had such an interest in the General Assembly. And we did that this year. We did that this year, being able to re remove these arbitrary barriers that I talked to. So we, if you want to say what we've done, why we do, who I am, I hope that you clearly understand why we do what we do. But the last thing that I would like to say is how. How can we all make an impact on your government? And I repeat again, your government. Rashad knows this. The basic fundamental point is just make, know who your city council person is. Know who your delegates are. Make sure you know who your senators, senators are. Everybody knows who uh, your governor is and your mayor is, but the reality is that the people that are on the ground doing the work, servicing the calls, we need to know who they are. That way you can then hold them accountable at that ballot. But if you walk up on the street and you ask many people who these individuals are, Dr. Cooper, I'm afraid, I'm, uh, 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 sorry, but you wouldn't know who they are. Then I always say it starts at home. We have a responsibility to be able to engage in our respective communities. I was very, I didn't know about my community association. I didn't care for politics. But once I started to invest in the neighborhoods that I was raised in, the people started to question, what are you doing to give back to your neighborhoods? And Dr. Cooper, when I saw it, it was a gentleman by the name of Tony Dawson. He was the community leader in Bel Air Edison. And Tony was in there with a whole bunch of women. And I felt sorry for him because it was the women that were running our neighborhood and Tony. And I felt the obligation to step up and do that. So I would say the first immediately thing is if you're not engaged in your community, please engage the little tiny things. While we don't think that they help, I'm telling you that they do help. The, sec the third thing that I would just point out, Dr. Cooper, I answer each and every one of my emails myself. So it's not someone fielding my emails because I want to see what's important to my neighborhood. So I would say when you have things that come before the Baltimore City Council, when you have things that come before the Maryland General Assembly, please email your legislator and just pick three things that you really care about and let them know your opinion. Dr. Cooper, I get a lot of automated generated emails, but the ones that are the most impactful, I'm telling you, is the ones when people sincerely take the time out to write two or three sentences. Sometimes they write two or three paragraphs, and those are the ones that hit me in a different type of way because I know that that was important to them, and that's what they cared about. i just like to lift back up the Urban Health Institute for doing this. I know that you said that this is your 10th year, so just a round of applause for the work that you all do. I thank you for bringing a number of my friends. I see them on the screen. I've got the text messages. I've even seen some an hour ago at a groundbreaking that said that they will be joining at this moment. I'm telling you that your roots are, are planted within our community. And I just say thank you, thank you, thank you for your leadership and your team's leadership because this is very important. Wow. Wow. Just wow. Thank you, Senator McRae. So inspiring. And we are just so fortunate. You said you are blessed, but we are blessed to have you as such a servant leader. And, you know, as you said, reminding us about the importance of not only our leaders being held accountable, but also us, you know, listening to people, responding to them, communicating and, and making sure we educate people. And so 
that's what we're all about here today. And we just are so fortunate to have you as you know, one of our leaders and an inspiring role model indeed. Thank you so much. So now we are going to move forward. I'm looking forward to a, a fireside chat with Dr. Kareem Creighton. Uh, the title of our chat is Giving Power Back to the People, Reengaging Our Communities for Political Change. Some of you may have heard his interview with our former Associate Director, Dr. Rachel Thornton, on the link between voting rights and meaningful police reform that was aired last year on the Public Health on Call podcast. You can access the recording of that interview on the resources page of the symposium platform later today. But Dr. Creighton manages Prim Card Consulting Services, a firm that provides election law, political participation, and redistricting guidance for community groups and jurisdictions across the country. So welcome, Dr. Creighton, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great event. So I'd like to start by asking you to tell us more about yourself and how you became engaged in this work. Uh, sure, I'm happy to do that. I'll try to be brief about it. Um, I am, as you mentioned, uh, currently managing my uh, consulting firm that does a lot of work in voting and redistricting and election uh, work. And we do it with a variety of entities, including community groups, but also jurisdictions. And part of it was uh, a part-time venture of mine, but it's become a full-time venture of mine as of late um, because I got interested in uh, the question about voting and elections really from uh, the time I was a kid. I grew up in a state that has a particular history with voting, uh, the uh, great state of Alabama. It has its highs and lows and stays in the news. And um, what I experienced there as a teenager or so, right around the time that the state had uh, started to have to grapple with the Voting Rights Act and how it needed to provide better representation for African-American uh, voters in particular, uh, right around 1992, led me to college to start exploring and thinking about it carefully. And as it turns out, it started as sort of an interesting paper and ended up becoming a PhD in political science and then uh, law school. And it seems as though the world has now caught up to this area of the law that uh, I have sort of been interested in for pretty much as long as I can remember. But obviously these days, it has really come to the fore in a lot of public discussion. And so I'm glad to be able to share some of these tools with uh, a lot of the groups that I get an opportunity to work with. Right. I mean, I think you make a very good point. And in fact, even as we speak, you know, of course, the Supreme Court is, um, you know, considering overturning some key legislation, Roe versus Wade. And, you know, I think we're going to really see this whole thing play out as far as how how important is like civic engagement and participation, you know, during these critical times. Um, but, you know, I know a lot of people do wonder, as Senator McCray talked about this, too, about the fact that people became apathetic, you know, um, just feeling like there's really nothing that they can do and they don't see that government is doing anything for them. So people may be wondering how much power and influence they really have when it comes to political engagement. So how do communities that have become traditionally disenfranchised by politicians make politicians listen to their community's concerns? We heard a little bit from uh, Senator McCray about that, but can you share some other ideas for us? Sure, absolutely. And it is absolutely fair to point out that we now live in a time where I think distrust and um, apathy, you can combine them, are at a, a rather all time high. And there's reason for it. Our institutions in a lot of circumstances have failed us. They've shown a lot of the uh, public ways in which they either don't function or sometimes function only on behalf of certain people. And that's really a challenge. Um, how do we get ourselves out of that? Um, I, I think it's an open question we're now exploring, but I definitely believe um, that we learn a lot from what political science teaches us. Um, one of the um, key factors that is sort of explained uh, political engagement throughout the world, not just the United States, is that, you know, isolation is usually the worst uh, element that plays against democratic engagement. So the one thing that you can always assure yourself of in an authoritarian state, you're gonna make sure that people are isolated, 
They feel alone in the things that they experience are only things that they experience and no one else. And the key to, I think, a dem democracy moving more towards civic engagement has to be reaching out to other people and finding what the senator described earlier, uh, ways in which people working together can accomplish common goals. And that is true before you even get to high level politics, that is, who runs for office and the like. You're thinking instead about questions of, well, in your neighborhood uh, or in your school or perhaps even where you worship, uh, what are the things that bind you together that are important and are there ways to enhance them? And so getting engaged in groups, and this is sort of where civic life really resides, uh, getting um, in organizations and associations that sort of allow you to see other people who share your interests maybe not all of them, but an important one is a good, important first step. And seeing where that exists first, and then going beyond that and saying, are there ways in we can work together, not just on the things that we care the most about, but perhaps other things that we share in common that we didn't know, right, brought us together, uh, is a really important first step. And that, as uh, the Senator mentioned, is the one thing that, you know, Elected leaders, whether they're very good, as it sounds like the senator is, or not so good, they care about groups in mass speaking out about things that concern them. And so as a first order matter, getting engaged with organizations really, I think, is a first step. And we can talk about different kinds before you even get to politics. But I'll just summarize them briefly here. Again, these are things that people know about. Community and neighborhood groups are you know, in abundance in Baltimore around the state of Maryland. Um, educational groups. Uh, if you have children, you are certainly uh, interested to have a primary concern about how your schools operate. Uh, that's a second um, type. And then there are just other social and fun groups. Uh, I just happen to see in Baltimore, there's a bike riding group of folks who are interested in green spaces. Those are things that you know bring people of a lot of different uh, walks of life together. And those are just examples if you're thinking about how groups, uh, you know, operate and where you can sort of plug in. Those are three examples of where we can start. Thank you. Thanks for those concrete examples, because I think a lot of times people want to contribute to change, but they just don't know where to start. So and then sometimes there are issues being debated, like, you know, Senator McRae mentioned, you know, things are being decided and discussed, whether we engage with it or the process or not. And so sometimes we really need to know too, like what, what kind of changes are going on? What kind of decisions are being made about our communities that we don't even know about? So how can people actually learn about what some of those key issues are that are actually being debated where they might have an interest in weighing into that conversation? Really important point, and this is another of those features of isolation that can be really dangerous in a democracy, having information that's both accurate and reliable so that we can all share a set of facts that we can work on either supporting or undoing if we don't like those facts. That's really crucial. How do we do it? Part of the answer lies in those groups that we talked about. When we have bonds of trust that we form in these groups, we can work together to kind of develop information that helps inform us, right? So that's one piece of it. Um, another piece of it, of course, is looking to, and this is now where I plug our local papers. Local journalism is another feature, not the only one, but an important one to try and collect uh, a viewpoint, not the only one, but a viewpoint of what our government is doing. We have to support them. So if you are thinking about buying a subscription, that's a good thing to do. Um, but, you know, there are other places as well that include, you know, websites and newsletters. Um, you know, Maryland Matters is one that I uh, look to now and again just to see what's going on. But, of course, a lot of um, people in our social uh, media world have now gone to Twitter and Facebook and all these other platforms themselves as politicians, elected leaders, to tell you what they're doing. So if you, you know, use any of these platforms hit a follow on many of your elected leaders just to get a sense of what they're prioritizing. And it may or may not be what you want them to do. And you may be able to communicate with them that way to kind of steer them more in the direction of things that are important. And, you know, the other thing to say about social media, um, and I think the uh, Senator mentioned it earlier, uh, showing up or keeping tabs on what the uh, elected leaders you put in office are doing is really important. And part of that can be uh, you are showing up in at City Hall or a planning commission meeting just to listen to what's going on. And I know it can be somewhat daunting, again, doing it on your own if you've never done it before. Go with a group. 
they're very, um, you know, open. These are public spaces that, uh, you know, welcome people coming in and observing them. And if you aren't really interested in doing that, there are two other options. Obviously, we've mentioned social media. Many of these things are online. They're easy ways of catching it. If you have something as simple as a cell phone, that catches up. But even if you don't have that, the other thing that you can do is invite your uh, elected leaders to come visit you, particularly when you're in a group. It doesn't have to be that you have anything explicit at issue, although you can always bring it up, but invite them to come get to know who you are because it's their job really to know who their constituents are and that you can get a sense from them about what the things are that are important, but that when there is a time that something becomes important for you to ask your local uh, leaders about, they know you. They know you because they've met you. And also they know you are bringing things to them that are important when the time comes. So I'd say those are you know, different ways in which you can engage with local leadership. And I think these are all things, again, as the Senator mentioned earlier, and I love the uh, formulation, they're your elected leaders. So it's their job to do this. So give them opportunities to do their jobs. That's great. You know, I mean, one of the things that comes to mind for me is that how do we have time to do all these things? And so we're going to talk about this later on, but I think what a lot of people don't realize is that this civic engagement process is not only good for your whole community, it's actually even good for individuals. It's even good for your emotional and physical health to be a member of a group where you're bonding around like common ideas and thoughts and, and priorities. So um, we'll talk more about the link to health, but, but it's true that doing this is good for the health of our communities in that we can advocate for positive changes that affect everyone, but also the whole process of it actually has been shown to have a positive effect on the health of individual people. So there are Cooper, lots of reasons. I, I just add to that, that's absolutely right. And it's certainly the case that, you know, there's so many levels of government and so many things going on in a moment that any one person can't do it all. That's one benefit of relying on members of groups that you care about and are associated with and trust to do some of that work for you. And frankly, among groups, right? You, every group doesn't care about every issue, but alliances among groups helps broaden your perspective on all the different issues that come up. But I love the link to physical health too and mental health being as important um, and having these relationships as you know the political health of the democracy. That's absolutely right. So thank you so much. You know, So I just wanna shift our conversation just for a moment to, to consider the effect of redistricting because I know that you do work in that area too. So. What's the effect of redistricting on people's ability to actually organize and, you know, begin to advocate for themselves? How can communities band together even if they have been shattered into disparate districts? Well, um, it, really good point. Of course, we're still in the season uh, of redistricting. Every 10 years, as you know, uh, the, every level of elected government goes about the process of designing and redesigning districts formally to make sure that populations are balanced to comply with the law. But in doing it, they're thinking a lot about how to make sure that communities that have like and similar uh, characteristics, wants and desires, priorities are grouped together uh, as in the ideal. Unfortunately, we also know that um, uh, because of the, in part what the Supreme Court has told us, politics and partisanship typically plays a role in this too. It sometimes can overtake every other consideration. And it's the job really under any circumstances of the public to be able to say to elected leaders what communities are important to try and respect in this process. Um, I've you know, advised, as you've mentioned, um, a lot of local and state um, actors who do this. And part of the um, real challenge is to make sure that when they wanna do it right, they're really taking account of what the public record offers them. What is it that people think are the district configurations that make the most sense? So the first step in this to answer your question is as a public during the redistricting process, make sure that you're working. This is one of those key areas where letting your elected officials, officials know what's worked or not worked in the existing redistricting plan that needs to be changed, what needs to be improved, um, what doesn't uh, work in the uh, you know, current scheme where people are broken up, 
or that there's been growth with new communities that haven't been around before that are in large number. Um, after the process, there's always the consideration of getting to establish new linkages with um, your elected leaders, right? You may be moved from one district to another, you may be a community that wasn't on the radar screen of an elected member because they weren't a part of your district. Now it's a good opportunity to build those relationships. And so inviting again, your member to come visit is uh, another relevant consideration. I should also add, of course, there are any number of cases where uh, communities don't feel that they've been treated fairly and where there are legal uh, actions to take. Uh, there should be, and for good reason, efforts to reach out and uh, ask the courts to answer that. In Maryland, of course, there is at the state level ongoing litigation that addresses that question. And then finally to say, um, you know, you may be uh, not in the circumstance where there's a legal uh, consideration, but maybe just politically you're divided in a way that you really shouldn't have, but there's no really uh, legal answer to your claim. There's always the um, option to make sure that even if the elected person who's uh, your elected representative isn't as receptive to you, know always that there are people elsewhere in the city and the state government that are. And so there are instances where, let's say an issue like environmental uh, cleanup is a top priority of a member who's not necessarily your elected member. Reaching out to them is also an option because they may be able to direct you to resources because of their expertise that maybe your local elected is not as equipped or maybe you know isn't interested in those sorts of issues. But there are a lot of different ways using uh, the sort of reality of redistricting to stay engaged. But I would say at the first instance, uh, I think the city of Baltimore is still going through its process, making sure that you're um, present and speaking to not just your elected, but also the people who actually as a body are making this decision, getting it on the record is really crucial. Thank you, uh, Kareem. So we, I have just one wrap up question because we are learning a little bit over time. Um, you know, as we talked about before, this meeting is really about how political and civic engagement are connected to health. And so it's been said, and we know that there are signs showing that there's a connection between public health and democracy. So just could you tell us briefly what a healthy democracy looks like? Uh, really important question, and that has a lot of different forms. Uh, my general take is that there are features and how much detail that gets into, I think it depends on the person. But for me, a, a healthy democracy is one in which first people are uh, engaged and they understand that the government is one feature, but only one feature of a vibrant society where you have, as I said earlier, a lot of connections that people have um, that go across a lot of different identities um, in, the, in the civic world. So long before you get to high level electoral politics, that there are nonetheless bonds that get people active and engaged and figuring out what their interests are. Second really crucial piece, and the Senator mentioned it earlier, is a level of accountability. That is for when we get to politics, when we think about the people who are elected, that there have to be consequences for either uh, bad behavior or perhaps just poor or below average behavior. Because everybody, because they're entitled to a vote, is entitled to, or because they pay taxes, as the Senator mentioned earlier, that everyone is entitled to government that works for them. And when you don't get it, or if you feel like there's a way in which uh, people can serve you better, that uh, you hold people accountable, get you know new people in office to do the work um, well. And then finally, I'll just say broadly that there's a sense of ownership in democracy. And that doesn't just mean, you know, as it, important as it is voting, there's more than that though. Uh, we talked about making sure that you're informed in life, but I will just say two other things that we haven't yet talked about and I wanna just highlight. One is to make sure that you're taking an active role in making sure that elections work well. Um, I'm still fairly new to Maryland. And uh, one of the things that my wife and I, when we got in uh, to the state did was to one, register, Two, my wife signed up to be an elections judge. Now she's a lawyer, but you don't have to be a lawyer to be an elections judge to help manage the polling places. It means you get trained in the process, but then you help people along who come in and who may have issues in casting a ballot. That's really important because people, particularly in communities that have been, let's say distanced or marginalized from the process, are more comfortable coming into the space when they see people who come from their community 
uh, managing the process. And then finally is the high level point, run for something. If you feel like there are things in your groups, in your churches, in your schools that you think need to change and you're hearing all about it, sometimes you're the best person to do the work. And so don't feel hesitant don't look for somebody else always to be the person to carry that through in government. Um, that's what I would hope to see in a vibrant democracy. There are many other things, but those are three things I would highlight first. Okay, this has been so enlightening. Um, we have a couple of questions, so we should really make sure we take them. One of them is, looks like it's coming from students who are early in their careers, asking what has been a lesson that you can give students who are early in their public health career uh, about this particular topic mm. in terms of what they can do uh, to, to be more of a, a, a force for good in this arena? Well, I would say, you know, coming from, you know, a background in training that really provides expertise is to make sure that you share that expertise to do two things. One, make sure you're talking to groups who don't commonly get people in the space who are bringing expertise and listen to what they're bringing to you. That is having um, these exchanges in communities that don't commonly have access to expertise is really useful. It's also useful to you, the person bringing expertise, because if you're really hoping to change communities, you got to hear what communities think, need, and want. I'd say those are sort of first level issues. And the second thing is also just, you know, be sure to listen across perspectives. I mean, it's one of the wonderful things I think uh, this uh, group represents, the ability to think intersectionally across disciplines. It's one of the challenges of somebody like me. I think about law and political science often in the connections. They're not necessarily communities that match up as well. So we have to sometimes work you know, within the sort of group of experts who think about these things a lot, but maybe in one part of the sandbox. So figure out how to be creative and entrepreneurial in sort of bridging the sort of different insights that we have so that we can do our work better. Because I think we're all interested in developing a healthy, vibrant society, but doing it together using our different tools is sometimes a challenge, but we have to be able to be flexible in how we do it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it sounds like the ABCs of community engagement to me. So uh, thank you so much for those enlightening um, remarks and for that wonderful chat, Dr. Creighton. Um, what we're going to do now is, you know, take a few moments for a healing, an artistic event. So as many of you know, arts and creative engagement are relatively new frontiers in health and wellness, but our symposium features some creative presenters who specialize in healing arts. So these are creative practices that bring a new perspective and promote healing and well-being. So first, we have a special video to share with you. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to Young Elder, who is a spoken word artist and a 2020 Baltimore Youth Poet Laureate finalist who has created a piece for us to enjoy. Listen up, cause we got a plan. We may be young, but we understand just what we need to help make a change and push the city towards better days. Yeah, don't let our age underestimate our power. With the right soil, we can bloom like flowers. Just be patient, cause this work will take some hours. With your support, yeah, the city is ours. Don't just talk about it, you gotta be about it. The youth is strong, we the next leaders, I ain't never doubt it. Say, don't just talk about it, you gotta be about it. The youth is strong, we the next leaders, I ain't never doubt it. Listen up, cause we got a plan. We may be young, but we understand. Just what we need to help make a change. And push the city towards better days, yeah. It's Young Elder, give the youth a chance, give us our platform. Let us use our voice to really express the issues that we feel and the things that we know we can change in the city and in the world. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Um, don't you just love the creativity uh, and the energy of our youth? So thank you, Young Elder, for just that moving piece and inspiring piece, uh, calling us to action. So next, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Bunting Neighborhood Leadership Program. 
It's a year long fellowship, which was established in 2016 that equips the next generation of Baltimore's community activists with the knowledge, skills and tools to be transformative leaders. So now you'll hear from several of our UHI Bunting Fellows, from Jonathan Moore about the digital divide and equity, from Laquita Chansey about creative solutions to homelessness, and from Khadija Hart and Atiyah Wells about a community public health program called Walk with a Doc. After we've heard from the fellows, Dr. Gwynn will help us move into the next part of our program. Hello, my name is Khadija Hart, Program Coordinator for the Healthy Community Project. We have a community wellness program. We feature the Walk with a Doc program, and so we have a doctor that comes out every Sunday. They'll do a 10-minute talk about a topic of interest as it relates to health and wellness. We'll go through a mindfulness activity. After that, we'll be led on a walk around the lake where we'll stop and meet one of our community partners, and we'll conclude with a community connection segment, and we distribute programs produce boxes, we have literature. We just really want to improve the health disparities that are within the surrounding communities. Health inequity is, is real. We have higher cancer rates, uh, there's diabetes, there's all kinds of comorbidities that are happening in, in our communities. And we as a people, we know that we need to get healthy. And so what we're trying to do is figure out what is the best way to do that. But this program is phenomenal and transforms so many people. People have lost weight, they're eating better. We're really just excited to be able to offer these things to the community. My name is Atiyah Wells. I'm the founder and executive director of Backyard Base Camp. Our mission is to reconnect black, indigenous, and people of color to land and nature. So I'm a pediatric nurse by trade, and one thing that I found is that black communities specifically are suffering from diet-related illnesses, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to start the farm. Bliss Meadows is where we are now, our 10-acre land reclamation project in Northeast Baltimore. We grow vegetables. We also have an orchard where we'll be growing some fruit. We keep chickens, we have goats, we have sheep, we keep bees project was started to fight food apartheid and provide food, healthy food access for our community as well as provide community green space because our neighborhood, Frankfurt, which is the largest neighborhood in Baltimore City, we have over 30,000 residents in this neighborhood alone, there's no access to green space. The park behind you is actually a seven acre abandoned city park that nobody has taken care of until about four years ago when we started taking care of it. Then we also own the vacant building behind me that we're going to be renovating into a community center so that we can teach people not only how to grow and harvest food, but also how to cook it and how to live healthier lives closer to nature and be self-sustainable in that way. Hello, I'm Laquita Chansey, the founder and director of Small Tomorrow Homes, and I'm here to eradicate homelessness. We build micro shelters and tiny homes for folks who are unhoused right here in Baltimore. Homelessness is a huge issue. The lack of jobs and transportation, there's a lot of different things that contribute. 3,000 people sleep on the street every night. So the idea is that these micro shelters can replace tents that we see around the city. With the micro shelters, you can lock them, you can keep your things safe, protected from the elements. In addition to that, you know, we think about renewable energy and including solar panels and batteries and things of that nature so that you can have fulfilled life. When I started this initiative, I knew that it would take me seven to 10 years to create a tiny home village. So in the meantime, we're space making, we're building with volunteers, we're creating community. It's whether it's a wellness walk, whether it's a garden shed or a food pantry, like we're there to orchestrate those conversations and figure out how to make these things better for the people that we're working with. So I'm Jonathan Moore, founder and CEO of Rowdy Orbit, and we're focused on building hyperlocal economics in order to drive community sovereignty. So earlier on, we were training people with criminal backgrounds to learn code, and we found that not a lot of people weren't going to hire Jermaine and Tawana. The problem became, how do we get community to hire their own, on their own terms, and taking it out of the system and putting it in the hands of the people? There's a gap throughout Baltimore City. Gap was broadband and it was internet access. We knew the neighborhoods where we didn't have access to the internet at all. We said, all right, well then, how do we put something in place where people can not make a decision, do I eat or do I have internet? How do we get high-speed internet 
for damn near nothing to people. And so what we're doing is just hiring and training up local residents and tapping into that rather than parents shooting in and saying, we're going to put our Wi-Fi here. We work with community and the assets stay in the neighborhood, the economics circulate, and people can work where they live. I'd say we were servicing close to 5,500 people a month. It's important on so many different levels. One, it gives people hope. There's a resource that's coming to my neighborhood that I can partake in it. And instead of me going to it, it's coming to me. It's, I never knew what serving leadership was until I went to Bunting Neighborhood Leadership Program. And once I started to understand this thing about servant leader and community organizing, it was kind of like, this is actually pretty, pretty cool. Bunting has really helped increase my sister circle. I'm around some really powerful, amazing black women. And we are all creative and innovative in our own right. And being able to come together strategically to be very intentional about the work has been something that Bunting has helped to foster. I never knew that I could do this until Bunting gave me the confidence. So it actually changed me as a person. I went from being this person over here to be in something completely different that I had no idea. And that's the cool part. And so I, I feel like I'm living a second life. That was truly inspiring. Thank you to the UHI Bunting Fellows for all the great work you do in, in the Baltimore community. You can read more about all of these creative presenters and connect with them by navigating to the People tab on the platform. Before we transition to the next part of our program, we want to know, would you please post in the chat, see how everyone's doing? How are you enjoying this uh, interactive platform? Uh, we want to also take a moment to uh, spotlight some other uh, parts of our platform. Uh, if you want to check out the resources and exhibitor pages. So we'll take a look in the chat. All right, lots of uh, praise for, for the Bunting program. Um, we also want to point out to be sure to visit our exhibitors hall later today and for the next two days. You'll be able to connect with local organizations working hard to improve the health of their communities via civic participation and political engagement. All right, so now we'll move on with our program. Next, we will hear from our distinguished panelists. Please post your questions in the Q&A window and click, click the thumbs up button to upvote questions to the top of the window. Dr. Perrin, are we ready to chat with our panelists and link civic participation to health and health equity? Could not be more ready. That's a great transition. Thank you so much, Dr. Quinn, and um, thanks for the for the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Andy Perrin. Uh, I'm the SNF Agora Professor of Sociology at Johns Hopkins, uh, and I'm a cultural and political sociologist specializing in the social and cultural foundations of American democracy. Uh, I'm going to be serving as moderator for this discussion, but Dr. Gwyn, uh, Associate Director of the Urban Health Institute, will also be moderating the discussion. Um, I want to, uh, to go ahead and welcome um, our distinguished panelists on linking civic participation to health, health equity, and how it improves health and social determinants of health. Um, I'm happy to, to welcome uh, Sam Novi uh, from Baltimore Votes. Uh, Joan Little from uh, Maryland Legal Aid in Baltimore and the city of Baltimore, uh, and Rashad Staten, the executive director uh, of CLIA and a, and a 2018 Bunting uh, Fellow, uh, and he was the founder of Catalyst of Change Enterprise and a former Baltimore City Youth Commissioner. Um, so uh, welcome to the panelists. Thank you all for a really inspiring beginning. Um, and uh, let's begin by asking each of you to please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background in the space of civic engagement and how you have come to do the work that you do. Um, and I think we'll, we'll go in order. So uh, Sam Novi, would you like to start us off? Uh, sure. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Sam Novi. I'm a co-founder of uh, Baltimore Votes, our coalition of uh, grassroots organizations all across uh, Baltimore that try to make uh, uh, elections welcoming for every single uh, Baltimorean. Um, you know, I uh, got into this work because I grew up here doing a lot of local politics and it felt wrong to 
uh, you know, and we're knocking on doors for candidates to, you know, to skip the doors of the folks who don't vote because, you know, the candidates all use the voter file to, you know, the public list of the registered voters and who's uh, who voted in the last election. And so, yeah, a uh, number of us uh, uh, with grassroots organizations in Baltimore have started Baltimore Votes to uh, to try to fix that through uh, making election celebratory and welcoming and uh, well run in Baltimore City. Sorry, my uh, Zoom wardrobe malfunction. Uh, thanks so much, Sam. Joan Little. Yes, my name is Joan Little. I work for Maryland Legal Aid, which is a civil law firm for the poor of Maryland. I specifically work in a child advocacy unit representing children in foster care. The staff here in our office, as well as the staff uh, throughout our offices, uh, works with individuals to give them advice on the various things that they need to know about, housing, consumer, that sort of thing. For children in foster care, we talk to them about their foster care placements and services that they might need. A lot of linkage is made with medical conditions because many of the children in foster care do have pretty se severe medical conditions that require regular follow-up. So we're thrilled to be here at the Urban Institute and we have to say that um, it is so important to engage all of the people who are in this community in the, uh, in the governance process. We do it one person at a time, giving one person the advice that they need at a time. We also have a presence in the legislature on a very limited basis, and sometimes have our clients come with us to present down there to make some changes that need to be made on behalf of the poor of Maryland. So that's, uh, what I bring to this table, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Terrific and welcome. Thanks so much. And then finally, Rashad Staten. A peace and blessings, everyone. Happy Winning Wednesday, as I proclaim. Uh, Rashad Staten, I proudly serve as the Executive Director for Community Law and Action Clear in Baltimore City, um, where we work to support the advancement of young people, youth, um, utilizing their voice and giving voice to power and positive change, um, where we host variations of different programming for all young people across the city to advance them in their civic engagement, advocacy, and voice, and connecting them to opportunities as well as our elected officials to en enact some change in real time. Our programming exists within Baltimore City Public Schools in the community school strategy, as well as doing um, work and supporting young people that are just as involved at our DJS facilities. I myself, along with uh, majority of my staff here all attest to a lived experience of being youth leaders and now operating in youth, um, young adult professionalism spaces. I myself came as a former youth commissioner, as you all know, as a Bunting Neighborhood Leadership Fellow graduate. I previously served as a U.S. Congressional Page under the Honorable Elijah, um, Elijah E. Cummings and a Congressional um, House intern as well as doing some work with Mayor Pugh's Legislative Third Bike Task Force. And I proudly serves as a former member of Baltimore Vert in our Maryland and a candidate in 2016 for, um, to, for City Council 12th District. So at the tender age of 31, I've been in uh, the civic engagement field since 15 years old. And my first exposure was the great Congressman Elijah Cummins. And I have many other people that poured into me um, all the way through my meetings of being a part of BNLP. Thank you. So it's a full circle moment and I'm glad to be here. Terrific. And again, welcome to the three of you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, again, my name is Andrew Perrin. Uh, I'm a sociologist and I study uh, civic engagement and civic dialogue. I'm interested in what it means to be a, a good citizen and how people engage across difference, whether that's uh, racial difference or class difference or ideological difference. Um, how, uh, how people can engage with people very different from themselves, learn uh, and, be, and be part of a, of a common community uh, for a democratic life. I, I do that here uh, at Johns Hopkins at the brand new SNF Agora Institute, which is dedicated to the study and promotion of, uh, of democracy and particularly democratic culture uh, worldwide. Um, so really happy to host it today. Um, I'll move on to some, some questions directly for, uh, for each of the panelists. And if it's all right, I'll start with Rashad. Uh, Rashad, how can people see the role of civic engagement or political engagement as relevant 
when people are strugg struggling to keep their basic needs met? Uh, and what kind of support do you think people need in order to be able to, to move beyond uh, handling their basic needs and being able to be uh, civically engaged, politically engaged in their communities? Hey, great question. When I think about the role of civic engagement and how it connects to real time um, social realities of those that are struggling or at the least point of trying to survive in Baltimore City and nationally, I think the first level of civic engagement is to make politics and civic engagement make sense to that person, right? Um, where they are in the current moment. We hear this buzzword and jargon being used of um, meeting people where they are, right? But meeting people where they are is being understanding and empathetic to their lived experience. Right. And if you as a conduit of in exposing them or engaging them in a civic engagement world, you must be either live amongst them or have similar lived experience. So in the sense of where do we all have a lot of this is all around financial employability. Um, I want to say mindfulness towards health and things of that sort. So how do you bring that conversation in real debt when I'm speaking to an adult? Um, that has a young person in school. I want to connect the finances to the bills that they pay, but also the funding that goes towards their, um, towards their student's education. And then giving them the, the connectivity to understand that there's two funding streams that goes towards the public education system, being from the state and the local. So understanding that you must also be aware of the General Assembly, but you also must be aware of the mayor and how the mayor elects uh, those that sit on the board commission, as well as when the schools are doing their own budgeting priority sessions and how you can be a part of your parent cab, um, PCAB, or how your student can be a part of the student government association, or how you can directly talk to the CEO. So those are ones. Um, when we're talking about employability, it's understanding what has been the barriers that a lot of times is not at fault of the the resident or the citizen. But if they had come across some justice system involvement, how do we work with others like Black Girls Vote Baltimore Votes um, Job Opportunity Task Force to help them to um, remedy the idea that their lived experience or having a criminal record this should not be a tarnishment to their employability. So how do we give them in front of folks as like a Joe Jones in the Center for Urban Families to go through a STRIVE program, right? And then after that point, when you start to connect them to that, the next level of civic engagement is to ensure that they have a sense of self-worth. Those that are mostly civically engaged are those that identify their own self-worth and are holding other people accountable because they know that their lives are, are um, deserving of receiving all that is needed to not just survive, but to live. And once we go from that survival to living, then we have the opportunity and space to go and navigate how to thrive in this world. So it's a lot of that is just taking these making sure that politics is politics as usual to the point that they doesn't just see political engagement and civic engagement as someone that has on a suit and a tie and someone that is not just correlated to the idea of what's on the blue and what's on the red side, right? So understanding that everyone in an exchange of power and an exchange of livelihood, every time we exchange something, even from a bag of chips, that's being a political exchange, right? So it's just making it to be the most common way and then showing up for them to understand how then, all right, now you have this issue. Now let me introduce you to your elected official because now before you make an ask, you've already made an ask of yourself and that's showing up. Well, that's really, that's really exciting. Can, I would love some, some thoughts about your, your work in particular and how have you worked to help people gain that so, sense of self-worth that then helps them move from surviving to living? Yeah, uh, that can show up in plenty of things that I've done throughout the years. One is uh, when I was a young person myself, uh, one thing that I've done and helped lead was one of these ideas. I'm, I'm a historic, I'm a, I have a niche for history. So I re and re replicated the ballot or the bullet campaign that was uh, niched by Malcolm X, um, in which his folks, he talked about the ideas of, so I brought the ballot and a bullet to correlate to the times when Jordans were being released and people were standing outside of long um, retail stores. If our community can stand outside for a release of a shoe, we can also um, expect them to stand outside for a long time to vote. So in a sense, when shoes were being released, myself and my peers will tap onto ourselves and do voter registration. Talk to that organization in that retail store that if you signed up for here, you get incentivized with a hat that matches the shoes. Right. So at that point, it's like, OK, you have time and commitment and monetary gains of purchasing something. What about using the same time and commitment to make sure that your schools um, are, are receiving um, equitable education? Right. The next one that we've also done was the idea of making sure that 
we have tapped into hosting youth-led forums. In the most recent years, myself in collaboration with Faraji Muhammad Independent Schools and City Schools, um, with the support of No Boundaries Youth Coalition, Heart Smiles, Maryland Hill and City Youth Alliance and those young people like Young Elder that they heard from before, we hosted a youth-led mayoral candidates form called My Mayor's Must. Then that exposed our young people who were coming into the young voting age to see and hear directly from candidates that not just uh, wanted to get the votes of their, their parents and their guardians, but they also was exposed to, okay, what is their ideals, what are their priorities, and how would they directly impact me as I transition from 16-year-old to an 18-year-old? And now we see these exact direct impacts of now having a young person like young elder that's being highlighted of using her arts and skills to create national campaigns that advance her peers and her population. Um, so those are just a few that I'm proud of, but there's tons more and there's many more of me um, across Baltimore City and those that are on this panel today that's doing impressionable work um, that is recognizable and should be honored. Terrific. Um, bringing, I'd like to bring Joan uh, Little back into the, this conversation as well and ask you, Joan, why would voting or joining a civic organization, for example, be at the top of the agenda for some of the kids that you work with? Um, and do you think there are any particular ways that civic life could be organized that might better meet community members where they are? Well, um, I think Rashad starts with the right place, which is uh, you need stability first. And the first thing that legal aid lawyers do is provide that stability by advocating on behalf of, of individuals for housing and various other services. In the foster care system, stability of housing is the first issue that we have to address and then to get the services in place for those children. In the school systems, they do have access to programs like Rashad was talking about. And those are service, those are programs that could inspire children to go ahead and, and sign up to vote as soon as they could and to um, work on advocacy projects themselves. The most uh, impactful time that I've had with children in the foster care system is when um, we have talked about a particular issue that affects a number of different foster youth and thought about how we could go about changing that for them. Um, the most extreme example is the example of how um, federal funds are spent on foster care. And there was legislation a couple of years back that was driven by one of the clients that, of legal aid that actually had a problem with his uh, federal benefits and with, and his receipt of those federal benefits. Uh, he went, he and I went down to Annapolis a couple years in a row and he really did inspire and cause some legislation to come into play that would actually make a difference for the foster youth that came behind him. So an individual youth can make a difference, but it is so important for programs like Rashad's to get out to all of the children that are in the school systems, to uh, foster youth that are in private foster programming through, foster, through Kennedy Krieger or Martin Pollock or any of those larger programs and to get to the foster parents as well to make this something important for foster parents to mentor and to provide as role models for, for the youth in their care to make sure that they take their youth to the polling stations when the time comes as soon as they have their, their voters card. So, I mean, I think it's really a group effort and it really is um, not particularly well streamlined. So that's something that really needs to happen um, so that we can make these connections and particularly for foster youth that they don't feel like they're all on their own. Great. And Sam, Sam Novi, let me get you into the conversation as well. Um, how do you go about establishing these kinds of partnerships how, who do you do the work with and, and how, do you, uh, how do you bring civic and political engagement up to the top of the agenda? Sure, um, you know, so Baltimore Votes is governed by an advisory board with, you know, grassroots organizations across the city. I saw some folks on here from the League of Women Voters of Baltimore City, um, Black Girls Votes on that uh, board, No Boundaries Coalition, which Rashad has mentioned, which does incredible work, uh, Out for Justice, uh, Baltimore City Chapter of the Lynx. Um, so, we, you know, we work with our partners to set our agenda for the year. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of different things we do to try to make the election system uh, more welcoming and accessible for, for everyone. So one really big thing is just 
communication, like clear communication about precisely when to vote, where to vote, how to vote, you know, who, what your districts are, you know, that the, there's a lot of room for, um, you know, taking what comes out from the state and presenting it in a way that's going to be accessible to people, uh, particularly um, over the last couple of elections where because of the public health situation and because redistricting, people have, you know, much different, you know, the, the, the rules are changing quite quickly and what people expect from the past, uh, you know, might not be the way it is now. So, um, so I think just how those, how that's presented and how, whether it's presented in a way that's overwhelming and alienating or a way that's welcoming and um, accessible is really important. So we really do a lot of work to just get things out in a way that's simple and accessible. Um, the other thing we do, you know, on this front is work together with our grassroots partners to deal with some of these, um, you know, policymakers and, uh, you know, power players who have a lot of control over the election system. So like, you know, how do we all work with the city board of elections, um, you know, not just to hold them accountable, but also to, you know, they, they're, they're doing their best with often with limited resources to execute something pretty hard, which is to run an election in America in 2022. And so, you know, supporting, uh, you know, making sure we're recruiting enough poll workers, um, you know, training people to register voters correctly and getting those forms back in, um, you know, showing up to board meetings and understanding what they're going through. Um, you know, that's a big part of uh, what we do also with philanthropy. You know, I think philanthropy can be really hard to access for a lot of community uh, groups, particularly philanthropy outside of Baltimore. Um, and so making sure that, you know, there's uh, intermediary opportunities, you know, that we're, we're serving as a trusted intermediary, that's, um, uh, you know, in, in appropriate ways. Um, and then the last thing I would say is just make, you know, elections can be kind of a scary thing for your neighborhood, you know, your uh, neighborhood group to engage with. There's politicians, there's power at play, um, you know, people can kind of, you know, there's C3 status issues that are challenging. And so I think just setting some like really clear base on like here are things that you can do that are allowed that are supported you know providing you know we do a ton of work with artists to provide like template materials like these posters and so on um that are that's really effective so just making it really easy and plug and play for um a neighborhood group that wants to do something in their neighborhood on election day to make the um the the election uh, accessible that they have that that's like simple to do and doesn't require you know, a whole hill to climb around learning the rules and raising money and whatever. That's great. Yeah, I, I had a an interviewee tell me a, a number of years ago, she said, you know what, I never really thought I was going to bother to vote because never really seems to matter very much. She said, but then you notice how many people are trying so hard to keep me from voting and suddenly I figure it, it must actually be important. Um, so, you know, maybe maybe that's part of the conversation um, that goes into these questions and, and understands that that civic engagement is part of surviving. It's not something that, do, that you do only once you've um, once you've taken care of the basics. Um, and, and that brings us right into this next set of questions. This is a conversation of, about health and health care uh, and how it's related to civic engagement. And so um, I'd love to know from from any of the three of you um, how you think access to health care or being healthier yourself, um, might encourage community members to be good citizens and what some of those linkages might be between uh, health and civic engagement. Joan, would you like to start us off? Sure, sure. Um, when I think of healthcare, so obviously the population that I serve, maybe it's not so obvious, but foster youth have a lot of healthcare issues and spend a lot of times in waiting rooms and waiting on treatment and, and diagnoses. I think those are all opportunities that a program could get in there and talk to the youth while they're waiting about voting, about their civic duties, about how important it is to get engaged in the workings of their community. So I think there are lots of opportunities there that we really underutilize. And I think, you know, um, you can't necessarily um, apply sort of a cookie cutter approach, but you can look for certain areas where certain clinics where, you know, being able to present something in a pop and fa fashionable way might engage the, the young people and get them starting to ask questions. And then the other piece of it is um, engaging the people, taking care of them, taking them to these appointments and making sure that those people set the right example for the foster youth. I do think though that dealing with folks 
own health problems connects directly to stability and stability connects directly to whether or not civic engagement is even on the horizon for that person. So the closer we can bring the two together, the better. Great. What are some of the biggest challenges you see for your, for your clients uh, in terms of their, in terms of their health care and, and being able to be uh, as healthy as possible? Well, they're not in charge of who gets them to the doctors. <laughs> so, so the biggest challenge is um, engaging either the local department's caseworker or the foster care parent, depending on the circumstances, to follow through on the treatment diagnosis uh, regimens that are needed and uh, as well as following through on, on medication where it's needed and watching the children make sure they're actually taking the um, medication that they're being prescribed. Um, we have some very serious diabetics. We have ch youth that have sickle cell. We have youth that have all kinds of very significant conditions where if they were with a, a functioning parent, that parent would be watching them all the time to try to make sure that they are getting the, the service that they need for their conditions. And I, I think it's just critical in their stability. Once, once they get to a point where they are stable with their, their health condition, then when they go to school, they can function. Then when they go to a rec center, they can function normally and they can absorb information that programs like Sam and, and Rashad are talking about, um, they can absorb the information and begin to figure out how to activate themselves. We do have, as I said, every once in a while, we do uh, work with a small group of older youth to try to get them involved in a particular legal issue. But it is a struggle because they're really just looking at their day to day. Where am I going to school? Where, you know, what am I doing tomorrow? What's, what's my placement? What's going on with my placement? So, I mean, it's very, very basic set that our youth are looking at. And one of the ways to bring them up and to make them a, a member of our civic group here, our community group, is to make sure that their basic needs are being addressed. Sure, absolutely. And what, what more important group to be represented than the folks that are, that are right on those front lines and, and experiencing uh, some of the hardest uh, conditions that that there are. Um, Rashad, I'd love to bring you into the conversation here as well and just ask um, what, you, what you think in terms of how access to healthcare or how being healthier um, it helps encourage community members to be better citizens uh, and how citizenship might impact health as well. I'll start with the first one. Um, one thing that I've learned, uh, is that health is your greatest wealth, right? Without, without being healthy in mind or physicality, it's not much that you can do, right? You, that's the only way that you can give your energy, your time and your passion is when you're healthy mentally, physically, socially, and emotionally. Um, and that wholeness in health in itself is not a destination, but it's a journey. And one thing that I've done to make sure that the ideal of accessibility to a healthier lifestyle or healthcare um, is bringing it to communities where they currently are. Uh, one, if we were talking about providing healthcare information and distribution to young people, it's connecting them to their school communities. If we can operate and provide these services where we are hosting pop-ups or stationary vending or informational tables during the times when they're transitioning in and out of certain classrooms or holding uh, school-wide assemblies that is culturally relatable, we're culturally sens um, sensitive, but also engaging and entertaining that a young person's um, learning scale in the way that they receive information, they'll receive it in a way that they want to take upon it in that opportunity that's presented to them in real time. So a lot of times when I'm doing programming um, with CLEAR or with other community um, organization and collaboration, we make sure that we reach out to our peer groups and others of like minds that have these um, at ready hands, uh, resources, information, and opportunities to vent. So we do citywide conferences, we do citywide symposiums. We engage at least at minimum 50 organizations to bring their young people and to bring their, their guardians and parents because we understand the isolation and the geographical disconnection between certain zip codes and certain parts of the city. But if we create a citywide effort and bring all of someone from 
Southwest Baltimore to Cherry Hill up to Park Heights. Those are different organizations that service different communities that have a different culture, but they'll be more exposed to other ones that doesn't have the capacity or do have the capacity, but don't know how to access them and get to those that we consider are, are at reach. Other ones, when we're trying to talk to our, I want to say adult age or our elderly or our hard to reach or these specified populations of demographic of people, we use our community staples. Uh, my dad hosts, has a, a business called More Than a Shop in which we use barbershops and beauty salons as community staples and trusted community partners to provide free healthcare screens. Um, we partner with Kaiser Permanente, R&D Associates to provide youth sexual health training and education to barbers and beauticians when they're cutting the hair or styling the hair of young people to inform them of how to be uh, proactive to make the best decisions if they are in a relationship and also how to address possible domestic violence and negative peer-to-peer -peer influence. Um, this has helped us to even advance the idea of COVID vaccination and dispelling myths. And how do we make sure that our communities are well-informed that they can make their own conscious decision um, towards a global pandemic, but also how it connects to these communities themselves. And the last without least is these understandings that all of this has to come together in a space where people are ready to receive this information. And one is when we have the bringing now after we have the trusted individuals, then we bring the agencies on board to make sure that our health department is there, our state department is there, our universities, um, our, our, our larger philanthropies and other areas that of support can be there all at the same time, that you can receive all three tiers of support from funding to direct servicing, to trusted individuals, to a psychologist, to a therapist, to a mental health um, expert. All of these are often there. And we host these conversations from community corner conversations to shop talks to virtual platforms, and we collaborate. And a lot of times that's way more impactful because we are building people, we're building off intentionality, respectability, that we can have these tough and courageous conversations. And health is one of the conversations that doesn't show up at our dinner and our kitchen tables all day, but it shows up every day in our lives. That's, uh, that's extraordinary. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd be also just be interested in the, the switch side as well. And if you think there are ways that, um, that when, uh, when folks do get involved, um, become more civically engaged, more politically engaged, um, does that, does that uh, have ways that it translates back into their health? Does it make, make them healthier people in any way? And are there ways that we could help build that more? Yeah, uh, I can attest that to my peer group, my, my close friends. I've seen them once they became mindful of their own health choices and healthy li lifestyles that they've become social entrepreneurs. Uh, and I have friends that lead Black, Black Men Run, Runners Run organization, Drink More Waters, who is a part of um, John Hopkins Social Innovation Lab and has become OSI fellows and things of that sort, that they've taken these initial scales that were small pilots and have created these new anchors and institutions using social disruption and innovation. And because they're from these communities, they know how to promote market and engage those communities. My friend who was a uh, former athlete, D1 athlete that went into working with MedStar Health created uh, possible rehabilitation for those that experienced um, strokes and physical disabilities. And he understood how it helped him as a physical athlete. And now he provides these same services for those that do not have healthcare insurance because he's able to then fund himself to go into communities that have the, that are not being supported or don't have the accessibility to healthcare. But because he have a love and a passion for his, um, his community and those that he's servicing, he does not allow the finances to negate the services that they should be deserving of. Right, and then you see others uh, that have shared space with me with BNLP fellows from Juan Nats to Kirsten Allen that has their own juice bar in the heart of East Baltimore City. And they're giving out free foods. They have their own urban farming and we're taking young people to urban farms and they're building their own fr uh, fresh vegetables and fruits. And you can see a young person then become mindful of community cleanups. They become mindful of um, of making sure that they're recycling. They become mindful of how they engage their neighbors because it brings a sense of respectability and value. And once you value yourself, you value your health and then you value the health of your community. Terrific. Thank you, Sam. Let me bring you into, into this discussion as well. Um, 
how do you think that access to healthcare or being healthier, a healthier lifestyle might encourage uh, folks to be better citizens? Um, and also the flip side as well, how do you see civic engagement as maybe helping people to be healthier? Yeah, so I mean, I, th I think there's uh, a role for every single institution in society to play, you know, for our work around elections. When we have an election, whether you're a business or a school or a college or a community organization or a healthcare provider, everybody has a role to play in uh, building the culture we have around elections. And so I think it's important for healthcare providers, like every other institution in society, to pull their weight in terms of, you know, providing voter registration opportunities, promoting voting opportunities for their employees, um, you know, making clear that they are part of our, you know, uh, uh, you know, citywide, nationwide effort to include everyone in elections. Um, I think there's a sort of more interesting question, I guess, around how voting can be a part of someone's uh, journey towards a healthy uh, lifestyle. You know, one, one thing I want to shout out, I know there's a, um, a breakout room led by a new effort we're partnering with called Voting is Recovery that supports peer recovery specialists in um, making a voting experience a part of someone's um, recovery from uh, you know, substance use, uh, which I think is really interesting and uh, really powerful. Uh, you know, and I think there's, there's a number of potential opportunities to create more meaningful experiences. And I think one, th one place where, uh, you know, there's, you know uh, since we're with the university where scholars could be more helpful, when people evaluate voter mobilization, they often only evaluate if it increased participation. And that's it. They don't do any qualitative, whatever interviews or whatever to, to actually learn what it meant to people. And if we're going to make uh, elections a part of creating more healthy societies, we need to understand not just whether people participated, but how it felt and what it meant. And so I, I think there's, um, you know, to the extent that that folks at Hopkins are able to, um, you know, dig into those issues with with us and other partners, I think that's uh, a super valuable uh, uh, thing that would help us uh, use civic engagement as, as a tool for uh, for health. Cool. Yes. No. That that reminds me uh, of what Rashad said earlier about moving by, moving beyond surviving to living, right? And that we use help use both being a healthier person and being a civic civically engaged person um, as helping people be um, uh, be part of their own lives, take help take charge of their own lives. So it's uh, really important work. Um, uh, we've been talking a little bit already about this question about um, about. How, how your work is, is relevant to health, but um, any, any thoughts any of you have about um, how the work that you do day to day is relevant to, uh, to health or to health care in the city um, and, and what kinds of changes you think might be really helpful? Well, I guess uh, my work is directly related to health care in the city in the sense that um, I and my colleagues deal with individuals who have medical problems that we have to make sure are being served by the foster care system, by the Medicaid system, and also by the, the private providers, the doctors and the nurses and the nurse practitioners who are supposed to support our youth. And we work with our youth in advocating for their medical services where it's needed. Um, sometimes youth don't understand, you know, how to navigate uh, when a doctor tells you to do a certain thing and you're not sure and you don't know if it's the right uh, treatment for your particular condition. We sit down and say, okay, well, this is what we can look at. Is there a need for a second opinion? Is there a need for other types of engagement with other, art other parts of the profession? How can we best make sure that your uh, medical problem is being served. And again, I mean, I think the connection to um, engagement in the civic process, as you teach someone how to empower some themselves, they learn that they're part of a greater community. And they, earn, they learn that as a part of that greater community, they have a say. They have a say in their medical care. They have a say in the civic items that go before the various city council agendas or the Maryland legislative agenda, and that they can change um, any kind, any part of the system that they want to with that empowerment that they have. Great. Um, 
Sam, how about you? How do you see your, uh, your work as being relevant to health? Yeah, I mean, I, I think to the extent that, you know, really meaningful voting experiences can be a part of someone's journey to a healthy lifestyle. I think we're really excited to provide that and, you know, I think health, you know, one thing, whenever we work with a new, uh, you know, a new profession, we do a lot of work with educators, for example, to make voting a part of uh, the educational experience that, that students have in, you know, Baltimore City Schools or our, our universities. You know, I think similarly, you know, then those educators bring incredible knowledge about how to make someone learn, right? How to help help someone learn, right? And we then bring our knowledge and in, in our coalition about how to um, how to include people in elections, and we 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 then build something together where um, where educators can really build a, a compelling experience around um, elections that 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 contributes to learning. And so I think similarly with healthcare providers, um, you know. Uh, uh, you know, folks have so much uh, experience about how to help people be healthy. And, and I wonder what could be possible if folks who know a lot about uh, elections and folks who know a lot about health kind of got their brain sinking up a little bit about uh, what the options are. You know, I, I think we could we could figure out a lot, but it's it's it takes, uh, you know, a lot of engagement and sort of iteration to, to get that design uh, right and get the experience right so that it feels seamless and um, and easy for uh, for for uh forever for voters sure absolutely rashad how about you how do you see your work as relevant to health and to health care in the city uh i think it's very relevant uh and i've recognized it very easily now i would admit that i did not see its natural connectivity until i became a bunting neighborhood leadership uh, fellow in which they introduced the work that we were passionately doing as community leaders under this public health lens but also giving us this larger lens of a social determinant Right, but from my work of advocating on um, HBCU equity um, for um, historically black colleges to the work of um, the civil unrest and the uprising in Baltimore to advocating for students to see themselves as far as the language and see themselves as young people inside of a public education system. I had no idea it all had a direct correlation to health until I went through the BNLP fellowship and it was a, a eye awakening moment. And I think everyone that was in that fellowship along with me, Jonathan, Rudy, Kelsey, and others, we all had this spotlight, a light bulb moment all at the same time. And we started to ask these even more intentional questions like, all right, what can we do to make sure that we are part of these uh, impressionable tables to move forward? And I think these are manifesting in real time, but more so where the work that I'm in with as executive director of CLEAR, even the work as a CBO, a youth-focused community-based organization and nonprofit, I know that our work has a direct correlation to public health and the outcomes and the safety and the healthiness of our city. One in particular, when we're doing our programming at Bard Early High School and College, we're supporting young people around college and career exploration. You know, once someone becomes more educa educationally informed, that they make more positive decisions and they're thinking more forwardly thinking for generations and legacies to come. So someone that's more um, educationally informed makes more positive decisions and it reduces their likelihood of going um, left versus going right. When we're doing work with our students that are part of the Gay Student Association at Carver High School, we are supporting young people in identity formation of their own lived preference for them to honor themselves, but also to work in providing peer-to-peer -peer conversations and address their school climate that they can show up and still feel fully safe, fully valued and recognized in the school community despite their lived preference and teaching others that will often have a bias of how to see them regardless of what their lived preference is. We know what that is that reduces the likelihood of a, of, of a student dropping out, that reduces the likelihood of the health implications to suicide suicides or uh, personal um, harmful inflictions on themselves, right? Or even violence and crime that shows up in our school community. So as a community-based organization and a school partner, we are assisting and sustaining a positive school climate and culture. Uh, we do work with our Department of Juvenile Services facilities in which we are actually providing um, programming to young people that are just as involved on Saturdays. What that does with that is to help our 
um, returning citizens, even those that are youthful age, to make more positive decisions and reduce their likelihood of recidivism. That right there will actually impact the next generations of young people so that they can make more positive decisions and their peers or their siblings can then learn from the mistakes of others that they don't have to replicate those same mistakes and be caught up in a system that is not better serving or won't be rehabilitating to positive outcomes. And uh, last, what we do is we offer coming up in the July time and, and under the window timeline of YouthWorks, CLEAR offers our Summer Leadership Institute. What that does is that advances young people to have summer employability and it reduces the learning gaps and the learning losses during the summertime because we are actually empowering young people to stay engaged in educational learning while also compensating them for being engaged in positive developments during the summertime which means that the likelihood of them being involved in things that are destructive or pessimistic to their future, they won't have the time to do because they're already engaged with a community-based partner for six to eight hours out of the day while get, becoming gainful employed citizens and stakeholders. And during that six weeks that we have the young people, we are teaching them about advocacy. They're building their own youth-led impact projects and they're learning how to talk to their elected officials and also creating campaigns that will directly influence policy. All of that shows a direct correlation to positive health income, but it even more importantly shows that how our young people can take ownership of their own livelihood and make sure that the youth population across Baltimore City are more healthy collectively. Terrific. I want to move to, in the last few minutes of our conversation, of talking about some calls to action. Um, and I'd love to know from each of you what, what you would suggest. We've got over 100 people on the, uh, on the call today. Uh, what would you suggest for some of the attendees on the call they could do to help get involved and engage other members uh, of the community? And, and I think this time I'll start with you, Rashad. What are some things our attendees could do? I'll, I'll start first with the lens and approach uh, that I've learned from those that have taught so much for me. When service in a community, um, try to, to minimize the, the idea of savior complex or showing up in where we think that we have to be pessimistic saviors or that is a pessimistic lived experience of those communities that need your help. Most of the time, they just need to be aware of the opportunities, the resources that are easily accessible, but need to be a conduit and a connector to that. From then on, another thing that I work with is when you see someone that has the, the opportunity to scale their impact and their resources as an organization, help them, bring them to your network of potential funders or potential agencies that can help maximize these resources to those communities because they already have a long-standing trust and relationship with those communities that sometimes those that are our audiences are coming from institutions, agencies, or academia, we need your intellect to be more behind the scenes and allow those community leaders and thought leaders to be up front because those are the ones with, that have done the footwork much more of the time. And the next one that I say is um, try not to, once you see that someone has a skill set that is impressionable and effective in a community, uh, let's collaborate versus replicate. And let's do that in a space where we are collaborating, understanding that we are culturally, um, as a city, are already operating in silos, but can you connect them to somebody that has the same passion in the other part of the city and find a way to connect them at a center point so that they can all bring those same people together. Uh, put your money where your mouth is minimize the conversation a lot about the problem and let's take and let's actually give space to solutions and hold each other to a timeline that we can see impressionable change uh, within four to eight years rather than waiting uh, for someone to see change within the next 20 years and another generation is trying to solve something that should have been eradicated resolved or uh, before they even came into existence give a timeline collaborate uh, and be and be willing to step aside and to give young people themselves the space to be experts of their own lived experience. That's great. Uh, Joan, what, what are some things you might suggest for our attendees to get involved and, and try and in, engage with other members of the community? So my suggestions will be a little more individual rather than group oriented. Um, and obviously on, on behalf of legal aid, I speak for all the poor in Maryland, as well as the youth in the foster care system who I specifically recommend, uh, represent. What I'm hoping is after hearing this discussion, the individuals on this uh, conference 
think about how they can reach out and connect to these vulnerable populations of people. Whether it be that they connect through providing free tutoring through the school system, whether they go to a program like the Court Appointed Special Advocates Program, which supports youth, it's called CASA. It supports uh, youth in Baltimore who are in the foster care system, whether it's working for healthcare for the homeless and providing volunteer services for them. Reach out to that community so that you can learn who these people are and how to best help them engage in civic work. Without really knowing who the population is, you really can't set up a program that is relevant to the poor of Maryland or the youth in foster care. You have to go out there and meet them, understand their needs, and potentially think about projects with them that will allow them and their power to spread across whatever the project is, whether it be legislative or regulatory or policy-wise, and make sure that when you're engaging with these folks, that you make sure you listen actively and don't look for a project that you think is good, listen for a project that they think is good and figure out how to access the resources you have to make that project work as an empowering project for the people that it will affect. That's terrific. I often say the first three uh, rules of, of a good deliberative engagement over citizenship, a good conversation are listen, listen, and listen. So I'm hearing some of that from our panelists as well. Um, Sam, uh, what are some things you can suggest for folks that are on the conference today to get involved and engage other members of the community? Sure. So first off, I just want to plus one everything um, Rashad and Joan said about being, uh, you know, just positivity and um, listening to what folks need in the community. Uh, in terms of specific, you know, we have a huge election coming up on uh, July 19th. It's in the middle of the summer, which is, uh, you know, great in some ways because it's good, like black party weather uh, and daylight. It's hard in other ways because it's like a weird time. People aren't expecting an election, a time when people might be uh, out of town. Um, and so, and this is a huge, you know, this is the election when we elect our state government. And, you know, as Rashad was saying earlier, you know, a, a ton of issues we're all talking about run through the amount of money that we can get the state of Maryland to spend in the city, right? And so it is, you know, uh, one reason we uh, started Baltimore Votes uh, back in 2017 was that in 2014, Baltimore City's turnout fell off a cliff and we had huge problems as a, as a city in terms of getting what we need from the state after that. So, um, so in terms of things folks can get involved with to uh, uh, make sure we have a great turnout in this election for our city, um, you know, we're gonna be hosting a really robust parties at the polls program. So if you wanna host a party, if you wanna volunteer at a party, um, you know, come to our next Baltimore Votes Coalition meeting. It's the first Monday of every month at 4 p.m. at uh, Open Works at uh, 1400 Greenmount Avenue. Um, so come, come by our coalition meeting or go to our website, Baltimore Votes. Dot org would also I know a number of our uh, partners run great individual uh, membership programs for the League of Women Voters definitely recommend becoming a member of that group or Black Girls Vote has individual membership um, out for justice with returning citizens as individual membership so I think just being a member of some of these civic groups uh, is a really great way to support them uh, in a consistent way and, and, and help build a constituency uh, for civic engagement in Baltimore uh, so yeah we just recommend getting involved through the coalition and we can connect you to a partner or just get involved directly with a partner uh, we need a constituency around civic engagement in Baltimore to build the kind of uh, civic culture we want in our uh, community. Great. Great. Well, I think um, we'll, we'll move at this point uh, to some questions from the audience. Um, Dr. Gwyn, I, um, you'll help us uh, select some audience questions uh, and please place your questions in the Q&A window um, so uh, we can ask the experts. Sure. Well, there's a number of uh, very thoughtful questions. I wish we had time to go through each and every one of these. Uh, so one question we have here is what are positive examples of government, community, and academic connections that have produced sustained structural changes? Great. Uh, I'll go. Uh, some that I see every day. So 
long-standing staple and anchor in our community center for urban families that uses philanthropy funding, state agencies and relationships to reach hard to reach communities. They address the parenting gap, the malehood representation, also supporting young people um, that has been just as evolved. Um, even from that, we have those that are community-based that are still trying to expand on their own expertise. And we just recently had a um, citywide youth equity summit um, hosted at a historical black college, which is our national treasure, D. Morgan State University, and brought over 200 young people to not just talk about mental health and trauma informed practices, but talked about entrepreneurship, talked about um, tech and innovation. They brought in youth leaders. They talked about sports um, and, and, and entertainment. And they brought these representatives from Baltimore, from all different intergenerational, so that young people can see themselves. And this was sponsored. Um, by our larger healthcare agencies, being a Kaiser Permanente, being a MedStar, being um, Hopkins, being uh, Morgan State University School of Social Work. And this is how you allow, this is how you hold systems and agencies accountable by empowering and funding these thought leaders on the ground to scale up the work that they normally do in a small base recreation center or in a classroom into a school to then go into a larger space and encompass more young people to be engaged within a certain time frame. Uh, we see this from the Baltimore City Youth Commissions, right? Myself as a former youth commissioner, and if it wasn't for the youth commission, I wouldn't have felt empowered to run for office um, at the at the age of 24 years old, which probably was is a, a testament to where I am as executive director by using our lived experiences. There's Baltimore is rich in resources, and I believe one thing that we have to do is change our narrative and our perspective and uh, recognize our growth and our wins. And as I do work nationally, I am learning that Baltimore is very progressive uh, as in regards to our policies and things of that sort. Now, we do have to be intentional on how we change our mentality and how we engage our communities that are often perpetuating the same data um, that is not allowing us to see the human behind those numbers. But that has to be like Joanne said, that has to be the interpersonal one on one work. But we still have to be mindful that we have agencies, community staples, anchors that are doing impressionable work every day. And it takes those like myself that can easily recognizable and speak them out at the spurt of a tongue and say, hey, I see you. I recognize you. And we see your impact because we see young people like Elder, because we see a Jonathan Moore, because we see a Laquita, and we see their work pop up every day. So I think we've seen these remnants and examples literally on today's call and throughout this symposium. And now it's up to you to continue a relationship um, with them and ask them how they want you to best show, uh, show up for them. Sam or, uh, or Joan, would you like to uh, contribute some other thoughts of, of successful uh, structural change collaborations? Sure, I, did, I wanted to shout out um, Black Girls Vote for a really cool project we worked on with them uh, in 2020. So it's called Party of the Mailbox. And this was, uh, you know, basically trying to figure out how to do our um, part, usual Party of the Polls program, which is like having helping uh, neighborhood organizations host a block party of the polls that welcomes new voters and increases participation. How did we do that in a pandemic where, we're, where uh, particularly in June 2020, there was no or almost no in-person voting in Baltimore City? Uh, and so Black Girls Vote uh, figured out how to make a box that included all sorts of um, fun voting swag, a burger cookie, a coloring book, a t-shirt, one of these t-shirts. Um, and I got delivered, uh, I think we did over um, uh, 6,000 uh, of these deliveries all across uh, Baltimore, did it with me with um, Akil uh, Trice and the movement team. So it was all local businesses, all local uh, folks working on it. Uh, Joy Baltimore packed the boxes. Uh, Derek Chase and his team hosted the building where we host. So it was a great community thing. Um, and uh, they did a really cool thing on top of that, working with scholars to evaluate if it increased uh, voter turnout. And it turns out that it did. And so that is now turning into a, a you know, very exciting piece of research that's going to inform how people mobilize voters all across the country. And then uh, in terms of structural change coming out of that, they, based on their success doing that collaboration, uh, they were able to get a fellow uh, from uh, Howard University, Dr. Ashley Daniels, who, uh, in addition to being a PhD from Howard, uh, she also is a Baltimorean. Uh, uh, and she is uh, starting to call the Black Girls Vote Research Network, which is going to uh, create more of these research partnerships to, uh, rep you know, to uh, address the underrepresentation of young Black women in political science. 
um, and hopefully then uh, create political science that is more representative of people's actual experiences in America. So it's still early stage. Like, you know, I wouldn't say the structural change is all the way here yet, but it ha they have set the stage for cultural change or for structural change. And I'm uh, excited about that. And, and, and it, the only thing that I could add to this idea of creating structural change is that uh, Legal Aid does make an effort to have programs like Lawyer in the Library and Lawyer all over the place, reaching out to the community in an effort to try to help people understand how the structure of the legal system works, how it works individually for themselves, and how if they need to change some part of that system, that they can change it. So we do reach out to basically all avenues of the community um, through these pro se programming uh, efforts where we give people as much information as we can about their individual legal problems as well as um, generally how to make changes in the system. Uh, it's our, our sort of focus that we addressing people's legal problems, demonstrating how the legal system works, helps people and empowers them to navigate their way to not only their problems, but their community's uh, concerns that they want, where they want to make change. Great. Dr. Gwynn, another question or, or Dr. Sure. Pepper, should we move on? I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, I just wanted to point out Dr. Cooper also uh, acknowledged an organization called Be More for Healthy Babies, which is a nationally recognized cross-sector partnership that's reduced disparities in infant mortality. Um, so the next one that's sort of gotten the most votes in the Q&A, um, as it's, it reads, as Black people who want to level the playing field, how would we go about finding all of the policies, procedures, clauses, et cetera, that is those hidden systemic and, uh, systemic and institutional barriers that would stop, hinder our success, whether it be educational, financial, residential, employment, et cetera. Well, I think how they find them is they get impacted by an inequity. And when they get impacted by an inequity, once they are empowered to address that inequity, they think through, well, how can I make this difference for more than just me? Maybe my, my community that I live in, maybe my community that I work in also has a similar problem. So I don't think there's one way to sort of go to a checklist and figure out where all the inequities in a system are. I think really it's what part of the system do the most amount of people get in contact with where they experience an inequity. You know, the latest has been these, these voting changes. Obviously, there are lots of inequities there, and that seems like something that affects just basically everyone in the community. And so it's a, it's a situation where some change needs to happen, and people who are affected need to be empowered to make that change. Uh, I'm glad uh, that you all put that question in there so I can read it, the language in itself. So I think it's it, that'll be a whole nother session uh, that we may not have time to, but I will give you my best to show up as who I am uh, as a shot. One in particular with this question being my own lived experience and how I show up, I always say this, your lived experience qualifies you as an expert of one of the possible and many solutions. Um, if you have found a way to navigate um, survive these um, unfortunate circumstances, you also found a way to live through them. Giving your voice to power and sharing your expertise is a possible way of remedying one of those solutions. There's not a one size fit all answer to anything, but much of us in our lived experience can help build up a multitude of different directions that can get us back on the correct path. Um, the second one is I always say, anybody that knows me, I'm a history lover, I say, be the spook. Uh, myself, since anyone has always, if I didn't understand it, I didn't trust anything, I made sure that I was at the table. And if I was not provided a seat at the table, it was either to create one or dismantle that table itself that feasted on you, but did not allow you to digest the information that was being discussed. Um, so that's one in particular. And the third that I would say is um, hold yourself accountable to be in this game for a long time. Um, system change is not something that happens overnight. 
anybody that is well um, that is well informed of politics. Most of it is 20 years ahead of public information. So understand the game that you are playing and be willing to stay into the long run and take breaths and, and find ways of rest restoration so that you can save yourself because nobody else is going to save a superhero besides another superhero. And it's up to you to take your cape off. Uh, and last, with that being said, it's um, be accountable to how much you can do. Um, find your lane and make sure that you are consistent in your approach and your intentionality and not just show up when it's election cycle like most of our elected officials. The work has to be done 365 and not just during a certain time throughout a scale of a year or so. So that work and that relationship has to be built over time with Senator McCray, with Senator Antonio Hayes, with uh, Mayor Brandon Scott. You must know who your uh, circuit court judges are, who's the ones that are uh, rallying and passing these laws. You must be willing to know what, how much funding is going into our educational systems and things of that sort. Be mindful, be informed, but be informed enough that you know where to angle yourself and rally behind and organize uh, all the time. Uh, Mad. I, I remember Bishop Miles always say the power is in organizing and it is not the leader. It is the people that they can organize to work with. And that is the strength to see change. So organize not just with yourself, but like minded individuals. And hopefully you'll see some systemic change in the near future. All right. I think with that. Uh, Dr. Cooper, we'll turn it back over to you. Sure. No, that was all of that was just brilliantly said and uh, done. I, I, this was just an amazing discussion. Um, I'm, again, so uh, energized and I admire uh, all of you so much for the hard work that you're doing in the community, but also the light that you're shining on this important issue and really uh, hopefully our audience is appreciating how much is possible, you know, just from hearing you talk about all the things that you've been doing within your organizations and with your partnerships. So there were so many interesting topics and questions raised in the chat. Um, I think we're going to be moving to our networking sessions so people can have more opportunity to engage with specific organizations and individuals. Dr. Gwen. I agree, so let's we'll move on to our networking sessions. Um, so the logistics of this, in the uh, chat box, you will see the list of the five networking sessions that will happen. Decide which session you wanna join. You can also move between rooms by going back to the agenda at the top and choosing another room. Uh, we'll now allow everyone to navigate their agenda and join your networking session. Please be feel free to join us back in 40 minutes at 3.50. Uh, for the exciting and final creative presenter. <laughs>